والسلام على أشرف المرسلين محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزبنا علما يقول الحق تبارك وتعالى إن الصفا والمروة من شعائر الله فمن حج البيت أو اعتمر فلا جناح عليه أن يطوف بهما ومن تطوع خيرا فإن الله شاكر عليم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here some of the rituals of Hajj. As we know, Hajj is a pillar of Islam. And among the obligatory acts of Hajj is As-Safa. As-Sa'i bayna As-Safa wal Marwa means to do the walk in between Safa and Marwa. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ أَوْ اعْتَمَرُ Whether you are performing the Hajj or you're performing the Umrah, فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَّوَّفَ بِهِمَا The Mufassireen are upon the opinion that this is an obligatory act or pillar of the Hajj and the Umrah. Uh, in the days of Jahiliyyah, uh, the reason why this ayah was revealed, in the days of Jahiliyyah, the Mushrikeen used to put an idol on the Safa, the mountain of Safa, and an idol on the mountain of Marwa, and they used to walk between the two. So when Islam came and the Hajj became obligatory and the Muslims wanted to perform the Hajj, they felt a sense of uncomfort, they would, they would, like a sense of discomfort that they would do the same thing uh, between these two mountains where two idols used to sit on top of each one of them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the cleansing of these two mountains, descended in the Quran that this is an obligatory act of worship that you perform the sa'i between the Safa and the Marwa. The Prophet ﷺ, when he performed uh, the Hajj, after the Tawaf and Islam al-Hajr, and he would take the stone and kiss it, he would go and he would perform the sa'i. And then he would command those who were with him to also perform the sa'i. Uh, he said, and he would, says that Allah, he would say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it obligatory upon you that you perform the sa'i between the Safa and the Marwa, so perform it. And of course in the hadith that we all know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the tongue of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Take your acts of worship, the way you pray and the way you fast and the way you perform the hajj and the, pay you, the way you pay your, zak your zakah and so on and so forth. Take that from me. Uh, and he says in another hadith, perform the hajj like you saw me, pray like you saw me, fast like you saw me. So the Prophet ﷺ again and again and again. He's our role model, he's the shaykh of all shaykh, he's the imam of all a'imma. Once a hadith has been narrated with uh, you know, a strong level of authenticity, that the Prophet ﷺ has performed a certain sunnah and commanded us to perform it, or a certain obligatory act of worship and commanded us to perform that, that we have no choice as Muslims but to submit to that which the Prophet ﷺ has come with. وَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Tatawwa here means that the extra act of worship. Some of the scholars, the Mufassirin, are part of the opinion that the Sa'i, as we know, is seven, you know, you know, seven times. Between Safa and Marwa is one, and back again to Safa is uh, two, and then so on and so forth. So whoever wants to perform eight or nine or ten, fala junaha alayh. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that the Tatawwa means that performing an additional Hajj beyond that which is obligatory, or performing an additional Umrah beyond that which is obligatory, or doing the sa'i at any given time aside from the rituals of the hajj and the rituals of the umrah. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ash-Shakur. And oftentimes if you ask somebody what does the name Ash-Shakur mean, they would say the grateful. Saying that is really an act of shirk. I know it's an unintended statement to make, but why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be grateful for us? He's not in need of us. He's the one who created us and created everything else for us. So we are the ones who ought to be the grateful one towards him and render the gratitude. The name as shakur uh, you know, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take a small deed that we offered with the sincerity of intention, with the purity of intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon embracing Islam and following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whatever small act, as was mentioned in the hadith, that one of you could only spend fi sabirillah a small sadaqah like a date. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept it with his right hand. And both of the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are right. He will accept it with the right hand. And he will grow it for this person who gave it fi sabirillah and from a halal source, 
a source that is tayyib, good and permissible. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grow this sadaqah for him until he, the abd, the slave, meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on judgment day. And this date has the reward as big as the mountain of Uhud. This is the name of al-shakur, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take an act so small, an act of kindness or ibadah, anything that's been rendered upon the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take that from you and he will grow it for you until you meet him on judgment day. And on that day, it will be like the size of the mountain of Uhud. That's what the name, uh, the name Ash-Shakur means. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall reward you abundantly for whatever little deeds you offer. For whatever little deeds you offer. And in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells us, لَا يَحْقِرَنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ مِنَ الْمَعَوُوفِ شَيْئًا that whatever good deed you offer fi sabilillah and upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, do not despise it. Do not look down at it. Say, oh, this is small, this is nothing. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts that from you if that's all he can offer and he will grow it for you until you meet him and it will be the size of the mountain of Uhud. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shakir. Ali means he is the all-knowing of all that we conceal and that we utterly manifest. إن الذين يكتمون ما أنزلنا من البينات والهدى من بعد ما بيناه للناس في الكتاب أولئك يلعنهم الله ويلعنهم اللعين. This is a warning for those who hide that which Allah سبحانه وتعالى has revealed in the Quran. And in the Hadith, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says, whoever is asked about knowledge, uh, a fatwa, uh, a piece of information that is mentioned or interpretation of an ayah or hadith that is mentioned in the Quran or in the Sunnah. And then they conceal that knowledge for whatever reason, personal motives, uh, enmity or dislike of the ruling, whatever the case might be. Whoever conceals that, the Prophet ﷺ says that on the day of judgment, they, their mouths will be covered with a piece of the hellfire. So whoever is asked about knowledge of the Sharia and they have it, then they must render it. They must explain it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking covenants from the prophets and the messengers, that you shall explain that to people and teach people the sharia and that you shall never hide it or conceal it. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ladina yaktumuna ma anzalna min al bayinati wal huda min ba'di ma bayinahu lil nasi fil kitab. Ulaika yal'anhum Allah wa yal'anhum al la'inun. So there's two punishments for them. You know, some of the Fasirians said that the punishment is the expulsion of these individuals who conceal the, the knowledge of the Sharia from others, the expulsion of these individuals from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word la'an means to exclude or expel someone from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ الْلَاعِنُونَ And whoever is alive in this dunya will also, among the believers, will also curse them. And there's a permissibility here to curse those who are disbelievers collectively, but not to curse one individually. Because we don't know if this person is gonna embrace Islam or not. Perhaps this person will, a year from now, two years, 10 years from now, embrace Islam as we saw at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and as we see now as well. And then they become even better than us. Their covenants and their commitments to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, they become so keen about the knowledge of the Sharia and about being, you know, servants, good servants to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, that they could be better than us. So this is one opinion. The other opinion says, no, you can curse even that individual who is an enemy of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala because of the hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when a man used to be brought for drinking and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would establish the rule upon him is that Umar ibn Khattab he cursed him. Why? Because he's brought to justice so many times for the same crime, drinking. And that is obviously prohibited in Islam. So the Prophet said, do not curse him because he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he loves the Prophet So they said that the disbelievers do not love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not love the Prophet So therefore the prohibition of cursing as a certain individual who is a disbeliever who is a hypocrite, who is a mushrik, who is, a mushrik, who is an enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is, is valid, is permissible. So these are two different opinions. Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa'ala. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَأَصْلَحُوا وَبَيَّنُوا فَأُولَاكَ أَتُوبُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَنَا التَّوَّابُ رُحِيمُ Of course, 
the exception to this rule of those who conceal the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the knowledge of the sunnah and uh, they do not explain it to people. The exception to this rule is for those who repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, part of the tawbah is to rectify the wrong. And we know that the conditions of tawbah is to give up the act, to regret the act, and to resolve not to go back to it. In this case, just like they've concealed it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to explain it now. You've had the knowledge, you have the knowledge, then you must uh, explain it as a condition of the tawbah, as he says, aslahu." Wa aslahu means they rectify the wrong that they've done, وبينوا, and they further explain the right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the tawbah of such individuals, even though according to some Mufassirin that in the prior revelations and the prior sharia's and, 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 and jurisprudences of other prophets and messengers, such tawbah was not acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that this tawbah is only specific for the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and for those who came after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That is an opinion. It has its weight. Allah ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كُفَّارٌ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كُفَّارٌ أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا لَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمُ الْعَذَابُ وَلَا هُمْ يُنْظَرُونَ Those who die in a state of disbelief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ The curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالْمَلَائِكَة Every angel in every layer of the heavens. Every angel everywhere in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ and all of mankind. Notice here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say and, and the believers. Means that even the kuffar on judgment day will curse one another. And will blame one another. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْأَخِلَّاءُ يَوْمَئِذٍ أَعْدَاءِ إِلَّا الْمُتَّقُونَ That everybody is going to be an enemy for the other person or for the other group or for the other individuals. With the exception to that are the muttaqun. Why? Because they've collaborated their efforts to achieve the mission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them for. In other words, when we come together to pray, we are collaborating upon the ma'roof to advance one another and to get the 27 edge instead of praying alone and getting one edge. So it's a collective effort. So on Judgment Day, we are so pleased that we've collaborated with one another. We've encouraged one another. If somebody's iman is weak, we help them strengthen the iman. If someone is having a setback, we bring him forward. If someone is not coming to the masjid, we encourage him to come to the masjid. If someone needs some knowledge, we educate him, so on so on. So it's a collaborative effort that everybody reaps the edge, the reward for on Judgment Day. So therefore, when you look at one another, the status in paradise that you've achieved is because of the help of your Muslim brothers and sisters. That you could not have achieved that by yourself. And of course, the success ultimately is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the disbelievers, the opposite is true. Meaning that they're sinking deeper and deeper in the hellfire. Why? Because they're enticing one another, encouraging one another to disbelieve and to practice mischief and to, you know, to, to build enmity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet to build enmity and conspire against Islam and the Muslims. So all of this collaborative effort will land them further and further you know, in depth and breadth into the hellfire, will land them a more intense punishment and a greater level of wrath from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mend our hearts and to bring them together. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us success in collaborating with one another upon the, uh, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدِكَ نَشْهَرُ أَلَّا إِلَهِ الْأَنْتَ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَنَتُوبُ لَيْكَ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ جَزَاكُمْ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته